I'm Scott Allen Miller, and this is my everyday life living in Latin America. Today I'm going to be talking about an interesting topic, something that we've never really touched on before, except for a short that I just made a few hours ago. Uh, but we're going to be talking about the concept of voting with your residence. You're all familiar with the concept of voting with your wallet, and if not, we'll cover that briefly, so make sure you know what that is. But this is an important concept, but your residency, or your citizenship in even more extreme circumstances, is an important voice that you have, possibly the most most important voice that you have in the political space. It is a chance for you to put forth an opinion that is stronger than simply what's convenient to say. It's a really important opportunity for you to both demonstrate dramatically what you actually feel about the results of things in your life and an opportunity to get that message across in a very meaningful way, in addition to all the benefits that relocation can bring for you. So we're gonna dig into exactly what that can mean and how you use that right after the bump. As citizens of a world with more than 7 billion people, it is often difficult to get any impression that your voice says anything. It is so hard to vote and feel like that vote actually goes into a pool that is somehow used, that your uh, opinions ever matter, whether they're barely opinions or really strong ones. It doesn't really matter. And of course, when there's so many other people who are voting often randomly or putting forth ideas and opinions often randomly, it's hard to decipher between people who really are passionate about something, really find something to be very important to them, something that would be life-changing or decision-making uh, changing for them. Uh, rather than people who just check a box and don't know which it is and feel that it's their right to put in an opinion even when they don't have one and it legally it is in most cases some places they have to like Australia uh, but in everything from business to life in a country you're often asked to give an opinion and we weigh people who are just randomly checking a box the same as people who are very passionate about something. And should we? It's not a very useful way to determine anything. Now, the point is not to discuss politics or business decision making, which we could also be doing, right? It's important to understand that these kinds of things apply much more broadly than just politics, which may be the first thing that pops into mind because we're on a channel that generally talks about uh, expats and relocation, and we're going to be talking about the power of your wallet and the power of your residency. But it's also true if you go to a fast food restaurant and they have an opportunity for you to fill out a survey and tell them what you think, and they say, oh, give us your opinion and we'll give you, you know, a chance to win a free sandwich or something, right? And then you suddenly you have millions of people filling out a survey that they're not passionate about. They don't care that the service was extra good or extra bad. They are just filling it out quickly because they want to move on and, and possibly win something. So they're not putting in an effort to give you a real opinion. Well, that makes all that feedback essentially useless. It's not entirely useless, but it gets pretty close to it. You have to really weigh it differently than if you were just taking feedback from people who are really, really excited about what a great job your business did or upset that you did not meet their needs. And even that, you have to weigh the people who are super excited are much less likely to put in that information than the people who are very upset. Even if they're equal amounts of impressed or unimpressed, the unimpressed are more likely to complain and be noticed. So you have to weigh all these things. It's very difficult. And these are just challenges that humanity faces. This is not somebody's fault that they're taking a survey incorrectly. It's that it is very difficult to get even meaningful feedback from people on any scale because just feedback doesn't work in a very useful way. And so that is something that we just deal with at, at every level of life. And it's something that to really understand the world, you have to interpret that all of the time. It's a part of just growing up and being a human. It's part of how we in, just visualize the world. So one of the reasons that we talk in many situations, and especially in business, that people will vote with their wallet. But this applies to other things and it gets dramatic when we talk about politics because obviously in politics you're voting with a vote in other cases and many of us know and many people uh, see that there's a power with people who have deep enough pockets to have a lot of money to throw around that they're able to vote using their checkbook in a way that basically negates any votes that people may put in 
through a voting mechanism. And so that's in politics, and that terminology becomes very dramatic when we're talking politics. But when we're talking business, it's also a really important thing. People may go in and say, oh, customer service is great, customer service is great. You could go to 100 different locations of restaurant A and say, yep, five stars, perfectly happy, love it, love it, love it. But then when, you know, you're, you're parents call you and say, hey, we're going out to dinner. Where do you want to go? Restaurant A or restaurant B? If you pick restaurant B, you're voting with your wallet that what really matters, where you're going to spend your money to eat, you're going to be. You say, well, I love A, but oh, they cost too much. Oh, did you include that in your five stars? How many stars would you give B? Well, five. Well, you're picking one over the other. So something's different. Of course, they could be incredibly close and one has to edge the other out. But that feedback that you know you're you're giving this like yeah consistently they're just fantastic but would you choose to go there nope they're not fantastic enough for me to choose to go there then what good is that feedback right there's the something there are they too expensive is the food not as good as this other place that you want to go to is the customer service just not as good all good but is it not as good right so that vote with your wallet is what tells the business that at least they're not living up to this other restaurant and maybe it's just location right but a lot of people a lot of times when people are uh, leaving feedback. They don't consider the location. Oh yeah, no, this place is great. I had to drive five hours in the middle of nowhere. I only stopped because I was driving by on my way somewhere. I would never go out of my way to go to it. This place I go out of my way to go to all the time, but it's very convenient to me. So it's not such a big deal, right? How do you consider those things? So there's reasons why uh, we want to use the idea of voting with our wallet, because it's something we can't lie about. You actually have a, this is where I'm willing to spend my money. And from a business perspective, they don't care if you like the customer service. They don't care if you like the product. They care if you're choosing it, right? Are you spending money on it? And can they determine if they can charge you more and you'd still keep spending money on it? They don't care if you like it any less, as long as you keep buying it in the same quantities, right? That's what businesses care about. So that's how they look at the world. And because a lot of governments run like a business or the individuals in governments treat them like they're in a business or like their own personal business, then a lot of times governments end up being run by votes from the wallet instead of votes from the populace as well. But we all know that and it's just something that we have to live with as part of how the world works. But the idea is a powerful one. It provides a voice that when you have sufficient income to be willing to spend some of it in a decided way, meaning you have enough that you're not just buying food to survive. You're not just putting a roof over your head to, to stay alive. You're not just getting clean water. Now you're actually choosing, this is the food I want. This is the vote I want to cast. This is what's important to me. You have money to actually make those decisions to be discretionary in how your money is spent. Then that carries a lot of weight, both because it's a meaningful vote, not a random one. This is not an effortless thing where, well, I got the morning off of work if I go vote, so might as well do it. I don't know who I'm voting for, but I got to look good and just check the boxes. And then I need to do it slowly so I don't have to go back to work real quickly, right? That's one set of voters much of the time. And then the other is, this is passionate. I'm willing to work for hours, maybe days or weeks or months, save up and this is where my money's going to go. So on one side, it means that you're pretty passionate about whatever it is you're deciding to do because you're putting your hard earned human labor into that vote. And on the other hand, to the people you are casting that vote with that are receiving that money or are not receiving that money, it tells them something really important to them that if they want to get that money, which is everyone wants, right? then they have to do the thing that you want. Right? So it's, it's very powerful in one showing that you mean it, but it's also powerful in that it matters to them. The actual process of using your money in that way. And I mean, this can be buying a hamburger, right? I bought a hamburger from this place. That is my vote that this is the hamburger place I, pref I prefer. Maybe not all the time, but at this moment, right? And that's how, that's how you tell them that you love their hamburgers. You can say five stars all you want. It doesn't mean anything until you're buying those hamburgers. And so we use voting with your wallet as an, as an important way of viewing the world. Now, when it comes to being an expat, it comes to being someone who's looking at relocating to a new country, that act of relocation is another moment that you have to tell the world 
what you think about things. And it could be what you think about the weather, right? So part of the problem is it, it can be a very, very indeterminate thing. We don't know why you're looking to move. Oh, lower cost of living, s lower levels of violence, uh, better weather, closer access to family, a language that I find really interesting, food that I really like. There's any number of reasons you may choose a new place to relocate to, but the act of relocating, of taking your own self and moving it bodily to a new place and making that your home. Now, of course, if you're vacationing, that says one thing, but when you actually move and relocate, it says something very strong, that this is unlike when you stay in your home country, you're kind of accepting the status quo. Well, this is what I was born. What well, I don't know what else to do, right? We don't know if you're being intentional. You might be very well researched and determined that you grew up and were born in the perfect place for you. And so you're staying. That's a completely reasonable thing, but there's no way for us to determine who is doing that versus the majority of people who are staying in the place because it's the path of least resistance and it's the path that takes no effort or research and it's the devil you know. All of those are fine, nothing wrong with choosing where you live based on those things, but they don't tell us where would be better for someone, it doesn't tell us where they would prefer, it doesn't tell us that they're passionate about it, it implies they don't really care. Like, well, it was easy, so this is where I am. But when you go out and move to a new place and put in that effort, put in that time, take that risk, put in the, the, the expense of actually getting to a place and establishing yourself, this sends a message in a lot of different ways. One, it actually is a really strong vote in many ways back to your own government, to your source government and say, look, Maybe it's the weather, maybe it's the food, but it might be that there's things we don't really like and we don't feel we have a strong enough voice that we can't change them. Or no one else wants what I want, so I need to go find the right place. That's okay, right? But it's also, I, you know, maybe a lot of people, maybe the majority of people want something and they can't make it happen. So what power do we have? We have one really true power. We don't have, none of us do, have the power to change where we came from. Meaning, yes, we, we can't change where we're born, obviously, but we also can't change it. We can, we, none of us have the power to enact any realistic change. Now, the people want you to think that, right, because it keeps the populace happy and complacent. But reality is, if you stop and think about it, can you significantly change laws, anything that really matters? Maybe you can get a new stop sign added to a corner somewhere if you put in enough work. But even that, you're gonna struggle with. Even if you identify a place that really needs a stop sign, it's gonna save lives. I did this as a kid. I was like 15 years old. We had a uh, intersection that was incredibly dangerous. It was listed as the most dangerous intersection in the state that I grew up in, and it needed better signage. And I petitioned the county to get better signs put in to save lives. We lost so many people on that intersection. And we went through the whole process, did all the things presented to the government and all this. And at the end of the day, they're like, no, human lives aren't worth a sign. And that was just their decision. There was no vote. There was no community you know, input. It was simply, we recommended it. And they said, no, we don't care, right? Because it was their budget, not their lives. And that was the end of it. And that was the whole thing. And even something so simple, something that I was so close to and so knowledgeable about and passionate about and put in so much effort, I didn't have the power to make a change. I did have the power to talk to someone, but I didn't have the power to make them care because it wasn't a priority to them. And so that's how many of us feel. We feel this loss of power, this impotence, that we just can't make real changes. We can't make meaningful progress in our own countries because what do we have? We have no bargaining power. But the one thing you can do is leave and select where you're going, either based on, I don't care what they do because it's not my circus, not my monkeys, not my circus, right? Or I'm going to a place that does what I care about and I'm getting the results that I want by selecting the place that has the results rather than selecting a place kind of ar arbitrarily and hoping that everyone else also wants the same results as me and hoping that together we can make that change, right? That you find everyone around you also wants the same things as you, rare, that you find that you're able to collectively make a difference and choose how you want things to run, even if you're the majority, also rare. Put two rare things together, very, very, very unlikely. 
Now we've had people make these comments. Now I've seen this especially to Canadians, but I'm sure it happens with Americans too, but I've had a number of, and some of them have posted it, some of it have said it, that when they talk about leaving Canada, they've had people tell them that it is their duty to never leave, that they shouldn't have the right to go out of their country. They should not have the right to see the world. They shouldn't have the right to vacation, and they certainly shouldn't have the right to relocate. They view them as property of the state, that you are a basically a slave who owes your labor and taxes to the other people of your country. And that's a really bizarre thing. And that is modern slavery. That not as terrible as chattel slavery in the past, but it's still pretty awful. That mentality that you are not your own person, that you can't make choices, that you are simply the property of the collective state and you owe yourself to them. You don't get to make choices. And if things are not going the way that you hope that they would, you don't have any recourse. And I realize that some people don't have recourse. Some people are very poor. Some people are just lack the resources to be able to do those things. And that's very unfortunate. Everyone should have those resources. That would be a much better world. But when you do have those resources to, to make your life better, you have, and this is especially true. So there's, there's two aspects to this, right? One is what is your voice, right? Do you have the right to actually make this kind of statement that I'm going to change my life for the better, hopefully, right? The other is, and this is even more from coming from the United States. This is so much more dramatic than most places, but it's true in many places. And, and it's always true at a national level that when you are from a place, so I'm, I grew up in the United States and uh, at the end of the day, if I remain in the United States, I remember I remain a part of the United States, then my existence becomes part of the engine of the United States. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying that's an unavoidable thing. All right. So everybody who stays in the United States is participating in the American system. And you can say, well, I'm going to change it from the inside, but that's not how things really work. And by being on the inside, you contribute to the power of the state. Meaning if the United States wants to voice an opinion at the United Nations, they have two really big reasons that their weight is stronger than other places. One is financial. They have a larger economy than most countries that are there. So they get kind of an outsized voice because of that. And their population is one of the world's largest. So they also get an outsized voice because of that. Now, I'm not saying that countries with larger populations shouldn't have a bigger voice. That is how it should work. So that's okay. But the United States has a single voice. The population of the United States is often split really close to 50-50 on many things, including foreign affairs. And so the United States, when it acts a certain way in foreign affairs, represents itself as a whole. But 49.9% .9 of the population, if we're lucky, doesn't agree with what the country is doing. In some cases, it's above 50%. Actually, in many cases, it probably is. But the weight of all that population and the economy generated by that population is all leveraged in a single direction. So even if the country is evenly opposed and should really have no international voice because it's, you know, negating itself, it doesn't work that way. And so the country gets this one super powerful voice representing as if the huge majority is very passionate about something that the majority may be very opposed to. And you can imagine very quickly if the US and Indonesia and China and India all had similar situations where they had very strong voices at the national level and were evenly divided inside their populations. You could have on a world stage what seems like the majority of the world population very, very passionate about something, when in reality 75% of the earth is very anti that thing, and they just don't get a voice. Now, if we break that down inside, now not everyone knows this, if you're from the United States, that voice that you have is not done by person, it's done by state in most cases. So I live in Texas. So my vote can't, you can't possibly state how 
worthless the concept of voting is in the United States. And it doesn't matter which side of the fence you're on. Now, first of all, the United States basically has two sides, right? Republicans and Democrats. It's been set up in such a way that there really isn't any opportunity for there to be anything else. There's a, there's a kind of lip service to a more democratic system, but the reality is, is that it's completely non-functional and there's no way to break that system. So being from Texas, that vote is going to go Republican. Now, it doesn't matter which side you are on, because I'm going to demonstrate this. If you're a Republican who lives in Texas and presumably wants to vote with your party, it doesn't really matter if you vote or not. Your state is going to vote Republican no matter what you do. Your voice is worthless. If you're a Democrat and you live in Texas and you don't want to vo vote the way the state goes, you want to vote Democrat, it doesn't matter what you do. Your vote is useless. The state is going to do what it's going to do. And you are going to be represented by that state as whatever that opinion is, regardless of how you vote. If the state is 50-50 or it's 99 to 1% doesn't change anything. The way that it votes is going to be the way that it votes. And there's even a possibility that if a minority opinion became the biggest part of the vote, it got more than 51%, there's still a system to potentially not consider that anyway and still do what it's going to do, even when the majority wants something else. It generally doesn't happen, but it can. There's a system for it. So at the end of the day, it doesn't matter who you are, what side you're on, your vote doesn't matter. It is a farce completely. Now, there are places where sometimes your vote counts. There's situations where it can count. But for the majority of people in the United States, and probably the majority of the people in the world, how you vote doesn't actually matter because it's not counted anywhere. Um, so that's a really important thing. And especially for Americans, I think is very discouraging, very depressing. This idea that, you know, we're pushed so much to vote, we're pushed so much to be involved in politics. And at the end of the day, it's all pretend. It doesn't do anything. And this is something I've studied for a long time. When I was 18, I wrote a thesis on the political education system that became part of the curriculum uh, of the uh, State Board of Regents where I'm from and uh, went to 17 schools, the State University of New York, the Board of Cooperative Education Services. Um, I actually had my principal fired <laughs> over the paper that I wrote. I really researched this even at a young age and something I'm very passionate about. And you just don't have a voice in the American political system, but this is generally true everywhere, right? It is rare that your voice is a strong one. Some places you do have a voice, but it's generally pretty weak. In the US, you generally have no voice at all. But if you take your passport and you move to a new country, you are able to not just make a statement about what matters to you. And it may be a little bit general. No one knows if it was the weather. No one knows if it was the safety. No one knows if it was the foreign policies. But what you do say is, I'm getting out of this system and I'm not going to contribute my body and my economy to this enforced group representation. And that's really, really powerful. And so when, when these people, you know, it's been in Canada, but I'm sure this happens everywhere, where they're told that it is their duty to stay behind, what's secretly being said is someone likes what is happening. And they're upset that someone is taking that opportunity or potentially taking that opportunity to use their residency to pull themselves out of that, that pool. They're no longer going to contribute as being an involuntary portion of the whole. They're going to separate themselves out. And so for me, right, I'm essentially apolitical. It doesn't give me this super vote to be able to say, this is what I think. It gives me a vote to say, this is what I don't think. I am not blindly following along with something I have no say in. I am not contributing to the population representation of that vote. I am now non-represented, right? Which is a much stronger representation than being falsely represented. And that's, that's an amazing thing that you have. And it's important to recognize that there is pressure, real pressure to the point of nearly violent threats that seem to be being made against people who are without even thinking, 
potentially going to wield that vote. That they are going to say, I am not, and not for political reasons under normal circumstances, but I do know a bit of my audience has some real strong political uh, feelings. And they're like, I don't like how things are happening. And I'm not saying Canada, I'm not saying the US, just anywhere, right? Things are changing. And this is mostly true. There's a lot of change in the world. And a lot of people are like, I don't like the change that's happening, whatever it is. And so they're looking for a way to check out whether they just don't want to be there or they want to make a strong statement. I don't agree with this. So I'm out. Right. And it's not about where they're going as much as where they're leaving. And it's a really strong potential statement. I am not going to participate in this any longer. I am not voluntarily going to leave myself in. So it's, uh, it's a powerful thing that you can use. And unlike your regular vote, when you change your residence, so no one can say, well, it wasn't important. It was just a thing they did because it was easy. No, this is a hard thing. This is a life changing thing. Yeah. Hopefully it makes your life way better. Hopefully it's a wonderful change. Hopefully it makes your life safer and more cost effective and just things get better, but it doesn't always. And sometimes it's just kind of break even. It's just a change. Maybe it just good for you. Hopefully, hopefully for all of my audience and lots of other people, right? That relocation is going to be this wonderful thing for them. But we often almost always don't think of how this is our one opportunity to really, really strongly say, I have not had a voice. This is my voice. I'm not okay with being included. It doesn't mean you don't agree with lots of things. It means you're unwilling to be forced to comply with everything. That's power. It says something. And that's one of the reasons why so many people find it so aggravating that other people make this statement, whether they feel like they're being left behind and they just don't feel passionate enough to do it themselves or they were taking advantage of the fact that the population was larger and by controlling the way that the votes are done, like in the United States, right? Gerrymandering, which happens at every level. It happens at the international level between countries. It happens at the state level, at the county level. It's just all over the place. There's so much of it that it's hard to understand just how worthless your vote is, how much it's pretend, and how much a minority can control the voice of a nation, the economy of a nation, the military of a nation against the will of its people, because the people never get close to having any say, but you can at least pull yourself out of the system because as long as you stay behind, your real vote says that you are willingly participating and lending your bodily residency, your bodily location, your population count, and your economy to that whole, whatever it is. And so that's why with a, with a different context, when people are pressuring you not to leave, saying you owe it to the country to stay, stop and think, oh, is, do they mean that I owe this like one Am I supposed to be like nationalist? Like you owe it to, uh, you know, to invade Poland? No, that first of all, that's not okay. That is never something that someone should, should be allowed to say. Like that should be red flags, warning bells everywhere. That's not the way anyone should portray their own country. That's unhealthy. But also, are they saying that it's not okay for you to break free and not be the property of some group of people who's controlling your voice. Why would they say that? Because they want your voice controlled. Why would they be reacting emotionally to you bettering your situation? Of course, right? It's normal. Humans get jealous when other people do well, right? Your buddy wins the lottery. You can be as happy as possible for him. There's always the potential that a part of you is just gonna be like, man, why'd he win the lottery and not me? And that's human. It's going to happen. Now, the way that we react to it defines whether we're good people or not good people, right? So we try not to let, we're always jealous, right? We're jealous of everyone who has something good happen to them. And it doesn't mean that we don't also want good things to happen to them. It's all about that balance because we certainly want good things to happen to us too. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with wanting good things to happen to everyone. 
But when you are in that situation that you are moving to a new country, it feels to other people like you won the lottery. I don't know why more people don't realize that they can just also make those decisions and go to those places. And some people do. And some people it takes time. And some people have reasons why it's very difficult for them to do so. And that's unfortunate that not everyone has the same opportunities. And I wish that we could fix that as humanity. And maybe someday we will. But even that, I can't hypothesize how you really could. But we could improve it at least. But when people get really emotional... It's good for you to stop and say, are they just jealous that I'm doing something they don't feel they can do? Or are they angry that I'm taking away something that they were taking advantage of and they can't say it because it would be terrible to admit and they probably haven't really thought about it in a really well articulated way like this, but they may be sensing that you are someone they've been controlling, not personally, but on a population level, you've been contributing to their goals against your will. And your breaking free is like a slave running away from their slaveholder. It's weird to think of someone who had slaves actually getting angry that another human wanted their freedom. Right? And I understand that they would be like, no, I'm losing my money and I paid money and I'm a bad person and it, I'm not getting the advantages of being a bad person. Kind of makes... I. It's hard to empathize with slavers, but they would get angry and be like actually angry that another human wanted to be free. And that's the reaction that I've seen of people. They're literally reacting emotionally to my audience, expressing their desire or plans or process that is, that is happening to break free of the bonds of the place where they were born to break free of their lack of voice and to go voluntarily to a new place and exercise their vote of their residency. It really can open your eyes to what is going on around you and how people are emotionally reacting and why they may be emotionally reacting. And in some cases, maybe it exposes their own frailties and that's unfortunate, but humans react that way as well. Meaning, maybe they wish they could move to a new place and they just can't bring themselves to do it. They have a fear of the unknown that's too much and they can't take advantage of the potential wonderful things that could happen to them if they were to overcome that fear. And that's unfortunate, but that's another reason why people may lash out. But really the topic today, I just wanted to really drive home, and I'm sure I have in a way too long-winded way, and only a few people are still watching, but there is a value, there is a power to intentionally being able to leverage your voice uh, in, in saying where you're going to move to and where you're going to move from. And this plays into uh, a discussion that I had today as well, and I mentioned this on the other video, that... Being someone who's an expat, I've demonstrated my ability to move to a new country. Every day I stay in the country that I chose, Nicaragua in my case, because it's where I want to be. I have the power to move to another country anytime I want. I'm not stuck in any way. I daily make that decision. Unlike people who stay in their home country, you assume in many cases that maybe they're afraid they don't know how to move to another country. Maybe there's something that keeps them from being able to go. But my family has demonstrated our ability to move to other countries and have done so many times. We just happen to eventually settle on this one and this is our permanent home. But we've been to many places. And we have the power to quite easily move to yet another country. If someone said, you got to move to Guatemala or Panama, and you had to do it in the next couple days, I'd be like really sad that I have to leave my home, but the actual act of moving would not be difficult. It takes very little time. We know exactly how to pack. Everyone knows how to do it. Even the dogs and the kids can do it with very little effort. We could move to another country with minimal effort. Leaving our home in Nicaragua would be emotionally upsetting, but the effort of relocating itself would be trivial. Knowing that that is always there, that power, when someone questions, you know, do you feel trapped in Nicaragua? Do you uh, fear anything? Do you, um, there's a lot of emotions that people presume we may have. And my answer is quite often, you do realize that I could at a drop of a hat leave. I am in no way stuck. The fact that we made a decision to make this our new home 
while it's our intent to stay here, it doesn't make us physically stuck in any way whatsoever. Our ability to move on is no harder than it ever was. From our very first day arriving to today at any given day, at any given moment, we could have left. And tomorrow we could, and the day after we could. But we don't because we choose to stay, because it is where we want to be. And that's, I think once you've been an expat for a while, that's something that feels natural to you. But when you are newly becoming an expat or thinking about becoming an expat and you're talking to someone who is an expat and um, you're, you're imagining what fears you may have or concerns you may have, it probably doesn't hit home that strongly that, that for me, the ability to move to a new place is so trivial that it's hard to describe how easy it is. I was just in Argentina for a few weeks. Um, I was there for a wedding. But being in Argentina, all I had to do was pack a few more bags and bring my kids with me and just not come back. I could have done that. It would have been no effort at all. And Argentina would easily have given me the paperwork to stay indefinitely. I qualify in every way. I have everything ready. I've done it previously. That would be so easy for me to do. And I only don't do it because I want to come back to Nicaragua. But if I wanted to go to Argentina, that's how easy it would be. And, and when you realize that, when you understand that the people around you that are all these expats were all completely empowered and knowledgeable and experienced enough that we know we could go to other countries, lots of other countries, really, really easily. The fact that we're staying in a place tells you so much about our opinion. I can say, well, Nicaragua is the place. But unless I choose to keep this as my residency, it doesn't mean as much. But that I choose every day for this to be my residency, I'm not saying makes Nicaragua the right choice, the best choice for everyone. What it tells you is that my confidence in my own decision is high, that this remains where I want to be. I'm putting my, not just my money where my mouth is, I'm putting my body where my mouth is and my family where my mouth is. That's not something you can fake. It's not something you can do casually. And it is the profoundness of that statement that I think makes lots of people fearful of it. They're used to votes or customer reviews that essentially mean nothing. They don't create any change. They don't create disruption. They might get a tiny message across. We got a thousand customer reviews. 900 of them said that our food took too long to come out of the kitchen. Maybe we should look into speeding it up, but it's just a drop in the bucket and they'll take it under advisement. That's what we're used to, if anything. But when you vote with your residency, you can't be denied, you can't be ignored, you can't be just swept under the rug and say, well, they, they just, it was just a casual thing. They didn't mean anything by it. No, it's a level of effort and you only get to live one place. I mean, you can spend half your time one place, half the time, but you know what I mean? You have one life to live and where you choose to live it is one of the strongest statements that you have an opportunity to make within your life. And that doesn't mean that the statement is anything more than you want a place that's I don't know, safe or cheap or has nice weather. You're tired of the snow. You're tired of seasonal changes. You're tired of allergies or bot flies. It doesn't matter. There's something that's important enough to you that you're willing to change your life to better it for you. It could be a huge combination of things. It could be one thing. And you can't necessarily assume that everyone is going to know why you did it. Because in most cases, very few people know why you did it. But the one thing you can be sure of is that the statement you're making is a real one that can't be ignored and can't be swept under the rug. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee. And buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller helps support the channel and the work that we do here. And uh, as always, get down there in those comments. Uh, ask your questions. Let me know what you think. Send in some videos of yourself that we can put on the show. All the information is down there in the show description. And I will see all of you tomorrow.